Uh, thanks. So I guess today my job really is to tell you a little bit about where the future of some of these fields might go, um, particularly as uh, these two different fields of quantum technologies and uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence start to uh, start to move together. Uh, I thought I'd start a little bit, give a little bit of our background and some of the motivations to to why we are uh, why we're interested in this field. So. Uh, M Squared is, is not uh, a data science company. We're a, a company that works in photonics and quantum technologies. But as we develop these technologies, we have the same problems that everybody else have. We start to create lots of data, and we need to turn that into something that's, that's useful and useful information. So at M Squared, we, uh, we work in kind of three key themes, quantum technologies that I'll talk about today. But we also use our precision light a lot in the areas of chemical sensing, uh, and uh, light for uh, life sciences, which is, uh, is known as biophotonics. So I thought I'd maybe start with some of the data sets that we're working with that would kind of then give a kind of context as to um, why the themes that we're seeing generally where our sensors and applications create more data uh, are important to us in some of our other work and how this can actually be, be moved forward as we see uh, quantum start to uh, enable uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence. Uh, so the first example I wanted to give was, uh, was this example here, um, where uh, we're creating an a Earth observation system uh, using uh, precision light. So the, the satellite in the top part of the picture here is the European Space Agency's uh, Sentinel-5P um, uh, satellite. And, and really, as we, as we move into an era of pollution and climate change, uh, metrology and the ability to get data on what's happening in the, in the environments uh, uh, is critically important. And what we, what we tend to have as, as a recurring theme nowadays is uh, lots of kind of iterative improvements over a long period of time, and then suddenly a new generation of stuff starts to uh, create more data than, than, we've, than we've ever had before. Um, so this satellite launched uh, a year past in October, uh, and already it's, uh, it started to create the, the, the best data that mankind has on the, uh, the state of the environment and uh, uh, some of the problems that uh, society has. So this is a map. We've all heard the, the story about diesel emissions, uh, sulfur dioxide. This is a map taken with uh, Sentinel-5P, where the red is areas of really high uh, sulfur, di sulfur dioxide. In fact, dark red is 10 times the World Health, Organize, uh, Health Organization limits. Um, so already we can start to see from space some of the problems that we're kind of creating in our, in our environment. But what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to take lots of data and we're going to have to look at how that evolves in, in, in some very complex systems. So that starts to throw up a whole range of issues where data science, machine learning and, uh, and artificial intelligence are going to be important. So chemical sensing has led us into, into these very large uh, data sets. The second area here is um, uh, using our, our uh, light-based technology. This is an area where we're imaging millimeter cubes of brain material. So this is the neural network inside a mouse. So this is uh, uh, looking inside a mouse's brain. And we can actually see it in three dimensions here where we've got the, the neurons and the dendrites uh, and the whole of the mass starting to uh, create neural networks. So only four years ago, the Obama Brain Initiative was the first time that we could really start to look at these sorts of details at this sort of level. But now we can routinely run, out, run data of, at this sort of level. Uh, the difficulty is the next thing we want to do is start to see the, the neurons fire so we can work out how do uh, mammalian uh, neural networks work. And as soon as we start to do that, we're throwing off terabytes of data in just a, uh, uh, just a, few, uh, just a few seconds. So some of the kind of motivation there uh, sitting in the background. Um, and, and really, this is, this, this is a kind of journey of precision light matches in with the, the whole um, evolution of this new area of science known as quantum technology. So it's almost 100 years since we had uh, the quantum leap, the leap of uh, mankind's understanding about quantum mechanics and quantum mechanical effects. Um, and this is an article that the UK community wrote along with uh, The Economist, really to start to see how does this play into the, the context of, uh, of the current day and uh, uh, some of the changes that we're seeing in the, in the world and, and where they can be important. Uh, we even made it to the, the front cover of The Economist, and it's kind of interesting because this was March uh, last year, uh, and at that point they were kind of trailing that this new mind-bending technology is kind of going to go mainstream. 
at the time, I remember kind of thinking, well, that seems like, uh, that seems like quite a big claim at this stage. But if we start to look at the things that, are, that were, were happening and the momentum of the, the, the building uh, in quantum technologies, I, I think that we're kind of on the cusp of that type of, uh, that type of development. So what, what I wanted to do today was to kind of walk you through the, uh, the stages of evolution in this, uh, this journey of quantum. Um, as with many things, the, the, the clocks, the kind of reference in, in time is often an important point in a, in a new te te technology. Um, sensing is going to be important as well because there's many things where quantum just gives us a, an increase in, uh, in sensing capability. And as, as we've heard discussed, there's so many different ways that sensing and uh, uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence all coming together create more and more uh, sophisticated uh, uh, um, systems to uh, to look at the world and to and to solve problems, and then the final step is is really quantum computing and and, and exactly where we're at in that journey towards uh, exponentially scalable uh, computing, where uh, qubits rather than bits are the are the form of our uh, of our, our technology. Um, so so we kind of started in this game through something that's kind of a really unusual way to to be at a conference like this today. This is our uh, our, uh, our source of, uh, of, of precision light. Um, and really, everybody kind of thinks of a laser as being a very <laughs> narrow form of light. Um, but this particular laser is about a million times narrower than, uh, than the sort of laser that you get in a laser pointer or in, in many other ways. And this type of laser lets us go all the way through the optical spectrum. And that, that's really kind of important because if we can couple that light into quantum mechanical particles, we can then start to create the, the, the logic bits for, uh, for quantum and quantum computing. Um, our, our company at one point was, was described as uh, selling shovels to the, to, the, uh, to the quantum gold rush, which on one hand is quite flattering, but on the other hand it's kind of like, well, what's the point of this? Where are, where are, we, where are we taking uh, uh, this technology? Uh, and about five years ago, the, uh, the UK community uh, set up to uh, bring everybody in academia and industry and government together to start to look at how we could have a, a, a roadmap to, to develop this, this complex technology. Uh, it's not the sort of technology that you can, uh, uh, you can have a small, small number of groups. There's a lot of specialisms uh, all the way from, from the quantum physics to some of the engineering that's required to, uh, to see these journeys uh, come through. Um, so the UK has got, got four hubs. Um, the, the National uh, Quantum Information Technology Hub is at Oxford. Uh, quantum sensors at Birmingham. Uh, quantum communications, so things like quantum key distribution and uh, system network security at York. Uh, and the uh, area of quantum imaging where we can start to do uh, imaging that's got uh, capabilities beyond uh, classical at uh, the University of Glasgow in, uh, in Scotland. So we've kind of got a UK community that's been coming together in this. And I think we're now at the first stages of seeing that community start to look to things like machine learning and artificial intelligence. Um, same picture in Europe. Euro Europe set up a, a quantum community a flagship program. So when we start to see the UK, Europe, the US, China, uh, other countries really start to, to pull together here, we can, I think we can kind of tell that we're on the, uh, uh, on the on the journey towards that, uh, that process of uh, um, the, a new technology starting to, to, to become realized. And really, when we kind of look at it, there's, there's different stages. We need the components. We need the subsystems. And really, where we're at just now is starting to integrate these together into, into devices that are capable of uh, producing platforms that we can then start to uh, uh, develop applications on. So that's the journey that I'll walk you through today. Uh, really with the idea of kind of trailing how these two things are, are, are coming together and why, it may, why they might be important in some of the applications that, uh, uh, that, that you're all interested in. So we're really in this, this kind of pivot point between quantum being a, an area of deep research in the, in the university laboratories through to making it into, uh, into, into real life applications. Now there's some, there's some barriers to that. You know, it's one thing to do things in a university lab, it's another thing to, to get them out into, into the real world. Uh, and th this picture is a, a picture of an optical bench in a, in a, in a quantum lab uh, in, uh, in Germany, actually, in this particular case. And really, it, it kind of shows the complexity here. It just looks like a, 
a, a plethora of different uh, different components and bits. And up until now, that's that's been one of the one of the problems. But the interesting thing here is, if you roll back to 1999 or 98, that's kind of what the optical internet looked like. Same sort of technology, same sort of benches, same sort of complexity. And when you now roll forward 15 years, and the integration and ruggedization that's happened through engineering over that period uh, has meant that that's now the backbone of the, uh, uh, of the internet globally. So that's the challenge, is to take the technologies from the labs and get them into the, uh, uh, the applications domain. Uh, I said earlier that these journeys often begin with uh, with something like uh, like timekeeping. So, uh, you know, here in London, we, we kind of roll back to the, uh, uh, the the invention of the Harris clock, the clock that enabled navigation, the clock that built an empire. Suddenly, a technology change on something like timing rolls forward to uh, to create a whole new series of technologies, and that's been the the I guess the tantalising star of uh, uh, of quantum. So. The lasers that we can produce to create ultra pure light, they let you start to turn atoms into these quantum particles that you can then control. In this case, for the tick of a clock, but as we'll see later, uh, to build the subsystems for, uh, uh, for quantum computers. Uh, and pretty much all the, the big national labs globally have programs to, uh, to improve timekeeping. And we only have to roll back to 2008 to see the uh, the issues around the uh, the flash crash and the the, uh, the economic kind of meltdown that we had at the time, we don't really know. Is it a trade in, in Chicago? Is it a trade in Frankfurt? What's happening? Times dispersed across the across the network just now. So the, the drive for uh, more accurate time standards and international time standards that can cope with the number of transactions that are happening each day uh, becomes a be, uh, becomes an important one. Uh, and this is a paper from uh, one of our collaborators in, uh, uh, in Boulder in Colorado, uh, where really they're able to, to, to take uh, a couple of atoms and cool them to ultra cool temperatures, I'll explain a little bit about that later, and to create a very accurate tech. Now when I say very accurate, this tech would be accurate to one second in 10 million, million, million seconds. So that's one second in approximately the entire lifetime of the universe. So this clock also happens to be the most accurate machine that mankind's ever made. It's got the precision that quantum starts to enable. So often we'll see the first thing that you do in quantum is the best, uh, highest performance thing that's, that's been achieved so far. So timekeeping and time standards so we can start to look at machines operating faster with more data uh, is, an, is an, important, uh, an important area here. So, I'll kind of move on to this slide here, and to some extent, it kind of looks like a series of dots in, a, in an old-fashioned uh, dot matrix display. Um, but actually, each of these dots is actually an atom. So each of these dots here is an, is an atom of rubidium. Um, and what we've been able to do is to use light to trap these atoms. And not only do we trap them, we can actually cool them. So we can take the thermal components out of them, and I'll explain a little bit why, how, how we're able to do that but we can co cool them down so that they're about a millionth, sorry, about a hundred millionths of a degree Kelvin. So we're almost at absolute zero. And that's the point at which atoms become pure quantum particles. And that's the point that we can start to play with them in clocks or in, uh, in quantum computers. So here we've got seven by seven atoms cooled and frozen in a lattice that we can now start to make those, the, the, the components of, a, a, of a, a quantum clock, a quantum sensor, or indeed a, a, a quantum computer. Uh, so how do we do that? Well, uh, Steve Chu, who was a uh, uh, Nobel Prize winner for this laser cooling technique, um, he was also Obama's secretary for, uh, uh, for energy, a uh, professor at Stanford. He, he suggested it's like, it's like throwing a ping pong ball at an express train. If you keep throwing enough of them, eventually you'll slow the train down. You have to throw a lot of them at the express train to, to make sure it's not gonna hit you though. But so in this case, what we can do is we can take lasers in from different angles and we can cool the atoms. So we, we've got the recoil of the photons gradually slowing the atoms and we tune the atoms so they slow down and actually freeze. Uh, and as I said, they freeze at about a few hundreds of a, of, uh, of a millionth of a Kelvin. So that's about 3000 times colder than deep space. So one of the reasons that it's been difficult to kind of get on this journey to quantum is really that you have to start to, the starting point is to get to places that don't exist in nature. 
Deep space, as far as we know, is the coldest place in nature, and it's 3,000 3, times colder than the atoms I showed you in that, in that picture. So it's 3,000 times warmer than the atoms I showed you in that picture. So this journey of taking things out of the, the university uh, research lab and in, into real worlds kind of started by starting to create these, uh, uh, these different traps. So these uh, magneto-optic traps. So the first thing we need to do is we need to make it regular to get atoms to, to, to that level. Uh, and that was achieved um, uh, over the last uh, two or three years. So around about 2015, we're starting to be able to engineer these things that we can, uh, we can, we can make them uh, reliable and that we can essentially type in on a computer and the atoms will behave the way that we, uh, that we ask them to. The next stage is really to start to use them for something that's quantum. So the kind of two key uh, effects of, uh, of quantum that are going to be important in the journey to quantum machine learning are uh, superposition and entanglement. Um, those of you that have heard a bit about quantum will know that these are the uh, these are the kind of key elements that will, uh, that will allow us, as we'll see, to build uh, systems that are more capable than, than digital systems. So the first thing we did was to, uh, to look at this, uh, this process of uh, superposition, really to start to get these ultra-cold atoms and play tricks with them. So one of the first things we can do is to, is to kind of show, uh, we've, we've maybe heard of uh, that you can have optical light and it can interfere. Well, you can do the same with matter. So this kind of strange quantum effect of uh, wave particle duality for, uh, for matter means that we can kind of build atoms that, uh, that run into interferometers. And these interferometers have uh, between a thousand and a million times better performance than optical uh, systems. So they become the basis for, uh, for sensors that are much more capable than any sensor that's been, uh, been designed up until now. So, for example, you can actually start to use these atoms to build uh, very accurate um, sensors for, uh, for gravity. Uh, and what we have here is a, is a picture of some of these atoms. So we, we, we set them up here and we put them in our little, in our little cloud. And then we let them drop under, uh, under the force of gravity. Um, but by, by changing the, the laser light that's applied to them, we can create this uh, uh, superposition of states and turn the whole thing into this atom, uh, atom interferometer. And that interferometer can be used to measure the, the, uh, the gravitational field with, with a million times more accuracy than, than anything we've seen before. So this whole apparatus becomes like a camera for looking at gravity. So we don't have cameras for looking at gravity, but if we did, we'd be able to kind of look at the floor and see that there's a, there's a heavy mass there and then look below and see that there's a void. And if it was really sensitive, we'd be able to see people walk around underneath because every, every object's got a, a, a different uh, a gravitational uh, uh, force associated with it. So the applications for this are to start and look at things like geophysics, moving through different forms of survey, but ultimately into, into construction and into uh, uh, applications that, um, that uh, are about the, the built environment round about us. So once we can start to build these new sensors, um, there's a whole range of them that you can start to do. Uh, we've, we've started to build accelerometers. So in our cell phones, there's accelerometers. But these accelerometers are about a million times more sensitive than that. So th these would form the basis for the ability to do inertial sensing. So we'd be able to do dead reckoning instead of relying on GPS or uh, electromagnetic fields to, to guide navigation systems. <laughs> We'd be able to, uh, you know, start a, a very accurate clock, an accelerometer, and a gyroscope in one of these clouds of atoms, and then we'd be able to navigate around uh, with uh, with precision using using uh, dead reckoning. So I thought it was worth saying a little bit about the sensors because they then start to become machines with very very large um, uh, multi-dimensional capabilities. So beyond just the processing power, we're starting to unlock a, a range of new uh, sensing systems uh, that haven't been seen before. Uh, and this is the, the kind of apparatus. So at the moment, it's, it's kind of large. It's this sort of size. Later on this month, we'll be showing one of these uh, accelerometers at the QE2 Centre in London uh, at the, uh, the UK Quantum Showcase. So if anybody's interested in really seeing these, these things in action, we'll, we'll see this all live uh, towards the end of the month. So we kind of, we've got sensors, uh, and the next step really is to, is to start and look at uh, quantum computing. So uh, Bill Phillips, uh, who uh, 
won the Nobel Prize for uh, the first demonstration of a, of a qubit, a quantum bit. Uh, he said that quantum information is a radical departure in information technology. He said it's more fundamentally different from current technology than the digital computer is from the abacus. Uh, so uh, Bill's a, a Nobel uh, Prize winner and he's used these types of lasers to, to produce uh, the early qubits. Um, he also is, uh, I'm from Glasgow, and he's also a visiting professor at Glasgow University because his, uh, his uh, uh, son-in-law runs the Isla Lewis Chess Man Museum. So he, he regularly comes through Glasgow to, uh, uh, to, uh, to see us and to talk about the, the future of, uh, of quantum technologies. So as I kind of get towards the story of how this can kind of move into machine learning, it's, it's worth us saying that... Um, Often in the early stages of new technology, it's a bit like the early stages of digital. There's a number of different approaches. There's uh, superconducting qubits that kind of that simulate the, the atoms and create artificial atoms. There's trapped ions, so that's an atom without a, uh, a, an electron in it. Um, there's also neutral atoms. There's other ways that people are looking at for different schemes uh, to, uh, to kind of create the qubits. Um, but for the purpose of today's talk, I'll, I'll concentrate mainly on ions and atoms because they have the required reproducibility as, uh, as nature, God, or whatever has, uh, has, has given us it. Each of those atoms in that dot is identically the same as each other one. Any of these other approaches has the challenge of making things good enough that they look enough the same that they can be, uh, they can be replicated without errors. Um, because one of the kind of important thing um, with... Uh, quantum as we look to quantum information processing is that we're going to rely on the superposition. We're going to rely on the fact that uh, we can create this, uh, this superposition of states to build registers to, uh, to really look at how, uh, how we can start to create new forms of, uh, uh, of computing power. And this is a slide from David Lucas at Oxford. And he, he, kinda, he has this kind of thought experiment, which is it's like you put all your variables in a pot, you boil them out, and you get, you get your kind of solution out the end. Um, so that would be nice in a lot of the problems that we're, we're trying to solve on a, on a daily basis, but, it, but it's not really quite that simple. And I'll, I'll come to, the, to this chap here, uh, Peter Shore, because um, he was a quantum uh, uh, theorist who, who, who defined a lot of the, the early potential for the algorithms that we're now starting to see uh, as, the, as the first stages uh, of quantum. And again, at Oxford, they had a, uh, there's a number of recent reports, and this is from the University of Sussex as well, where they're kind of suggesting quantum computing has gone from the unthinkable. Um, I think they mean the unthinkable is that a quantum computer is, uh, is as, as we know it, the, uh, the most uh, uh, capable computing platform that can be made under the rules of physics, as we understand them, ever. So we'll make a leap to quantum, and as far as we understand it, that's it. There's nothing, there's nothing, there's not another generation after that, but uh, science has shown us that it's always got a... Uh, a habit of keeping us on our toes, and uh, there could indeed be something, uh, something next. Um, so I said we'd, we'd look at the, the basis of the, the, the quantum computer, um, and I'm going to kind of talk about, about two things today, because um, as we'll see in the journey to be able to create the architectures that are important to get to some form of machine learning or artificial intelligence that's, uh, that's, that's actually going to move the whole field forward, we actually need to get to some scale uh, and, and the scale is, is, is an important part of the problem. So we've got uh, ions. Um, now, uh, when I talk about decoherence, that's, that's the, the ability by which we can create these superpositions and also the ability by which we can entangle many, uh, many different uh, uh, atoms into, uh, into an ensemble that can, that can behave in a, in a quantum en ensemble manner. So, uh, qubits and ions are the ones that have had, a, had the highest uh, uh, perfection or fidelity. So they're the ones that have the lowest rates of error, which are going to be important in building some of these uh, computational uh, systems. So uh, low error rates, easy to uh, address. Uh, but on the other hand, there's a limited about, uh, amount of scalability. And the, the issues and how you kind of make the, uh, the ion-based systems bigger ha has got some challenges. Uh, really what's happening there is as you, as you try and line up more ions, because you've taken a, uh, an electron of charge off each atom, 
you, you, you get decoherence on the ones that are very, very far away from the, from the other ones. So some challenges to scaling, but a lot of the current work is showing that these systems are, are, are actually very capable and in some ways demonstrating some of the first things that, that really are beyond what we can achieve with, uh, with classical systems. Uh, then if we, take, uh, if we take neutral atoms, they've got uh, built-in scalability. The, the picture that I showed you with the atoms right now, the, uh, our name is the, the kind of world's smallest graffiti. That picture there is seven by seven. So that's, origin that's the potential to be 50 qubits. And if we look at the, the journey that uh, superconducting has done, and we'll, we'll talk a bit about quantum annealers, if you look at that journey, it's taken a long way to get up to a few tens of, uh, of qubits on, on that journey. So atoms come with this ability that you can, you can write your name in them, you can, you can capture them, and you can look after them with the, with the laser light, but you can also scale them. So that in a millimeter square, you'd be able to get 10,000. So 10,000 qubits would be the, the density of a, 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 of, a, of a millimeter square. Uh, and it's, it's generally accepted that we need to get to about 144 to build a system that's more capable than the most capable supercomputer that's been built in the world. So 10,000 on a millimeter cube is going to transform uh, the capability of, uh, uh, of uh, computation. So the, the journey here really has been, uh, it's kind of illustrated in, in this graph here from about 2000. So the dot up there at the top is, uh, is, is Bill Phillips' uh, result. So you get, uh, as with all these things, you get a Nobel Prize for putting the first dot in a graph that's actually the worst data point in the whole graph. But because he was first, he actually showed that we could, uh, we could start and move somewhere. And over the, the interim inter, uh, period down to about 2016, They've been improving these uh, these quantum gates and the fidelity of them, so that now University of Oxford, University of Innsbruck, they can now achieve about one part in ten to the eight of error. So that's a small enough error that we can start to look at how these things scale uh, with superposition. Um, because the, the kind of important thing here is that digital squares with n squared, where n is the number of uh, bits, but for quantum it goes as two to the power of n. So as we start to add the bits. We've got this exponential growth in, in data power, in dating, in com, uh, computational power. But if there's a lot of errors, that's what's going to kill us because the errors are going to scale exponentially as well. So this this drive to kind of create the the very low error rate uh, ions has been uh, uh, kind of critically important. Uh, and this is another slide that I, I borrowed from uh, from David Lucas at the, the University of Oxford. And it really shows, the, the, when we wrote that article for The Economist about a, a year and a half ago, it shows the sort of state of the art here. Uh, and he described this as, as, as climbing Mount Impossible, where this is the, uh, the number of operations on a logarithmic scale of a, a computer based on the, the error rate and the number of qubits that we can scale. So if we can get up onto this plateau, uh, we're going to need a uh, few hundreds of thousands of qubits, and we're going to need them with very high uh, fidelity or very low error rates. But once we get up there, we can create a 10 with 50 zeros after it of computations in a few microseconds. So suddenly we get into this, uh, this new regime of uh, massively parallel uh, computational power. It's going to be different though, and one of the things we have to realize is what are the things that you can do with quantum and what are the things that you can't do with quantum? So I'll come to them. Uh, a little bit, uh, a little bit later. Um, so, as I said, uh, the ions have been a really good platform for starting this uh, early stage journey. So, this is uh, uh, a photograph of uh, uh, 14, I think, um, uh, qubits from uh, Rainer Blatt and uh, Thomas Mons at the uh, at the University of Innsbruck. Uh, and 14 is enough that you can really start to do things that are. Uh, application important because we can start to prove, prove out some of the journey in, uh, in, in, in quantum here. Um, there's kind of a lot of complexity as to how you, how you do this, but the picture here is really to sort of show that we're now kind of creating modular systems uh, and people are now starting to recognize that there are commercial prospects for, uh, for, for these platforms. So what sort of thing can you do uh, with, the, uh, with the systems that have, have been created so far? Um, quantum, quantum simulation. So simulation is this kind of halfway house between uh, pure, uh, pure, you know, between digital that we've got just now and, and 
uh, scalable quantum computing, where we can start to use uh, simulations of very complex multi, uh, multi-dimensional um, problems uh, using very small scale uh, uh, quantum computers. So the, the one that's been demonstrated at uh, Innsbruck is really to look at how, does, how do two hydrogen atoms, uh, how do they bond kind of using the, uh, uh, the, the process from first principles or how does a hydrogen and a lithium uh, uh, atom bond? Uh, and really those are, those are the first class of problems that are just too complex to do on a, 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 a digital system. Um, so, that, so simulation and when it comes into machine learning, simulation of uh, very data intensive processes is a, is a nice area to start to, uh, to, to show uh, what quantum might be able to do for us. Um, we can also simulate, uh, we can, so we can sim simulate uh, 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 quantum chemistry. Um, but what I'll talk a little bit about later is we can start to look at things like the, uh, uh, the scale scalable Schur algorithm. So this is this algorithm that really lets us look at um, uh, factorization and can we look at factorization on a, uh, on a scalable manner. So I'll, c I'll come back to that uh, shortly. Uh, so at the moment, you, you might be sitting there thinking, well, this whole thing kind of sounds interesting, but we saw the university lab, we see how it's kind of getting smaller, um, but is this ever going to make its way into, uh, into uh, a computer that we'll use in a, in a kind of practical application for, uh, for machine learning? Well, these are, the, uh, these are some of the, the, the best um, uh, chip designs. So we can actually see here a, a chip that was uh, designed at the National Physical Laboratory in Teddington that will trap uh, five ions in this particular case. So roughly, uh, roughly a third of the sort of system level capability that the, uh, the, the team in, Ox in uh, Innsbruck have, have demonstrated. And that lets, us, that lets us sort of start to see, okay, we, could, you know, we, can, uh, we can put all the lasers in a, in a rack and then we can fiber couple and we can start to create computational systems uh, that are modular and scalable. So we can actually start to create some uh, uh, some small scale with ions, which we said we can't uh, we can't scale it up too easy. But if we if we keep them in blocks of five, we can uh, we can uh, control them very accurately at the at the chip level. So I, I said if we want to go to to bigger scale, um, we really want to be looking at, at, at neutral atoms. Uh, and really, what we what we're doing here is we we can kind of create this array of atoms where we just use light to hold everything in place. We capture the output on a camera. And then we just use uh, uh, standard digital systems to build the, uh, the processing and the, the computational uh, uh, controls uh, uh, around the system. Uh, now, I did, I did say it kind of looks a bit like uh, an inventor's backyard at the moment. So that's the, uh, the basis of the quantum computer that we're building in, uh, in, in Glasgow. And that's the chamber that's at the, at the heart of it. But I thought it was kind of useful just to, just to see that this stuff's real. It's starting to happen and we're, we're, we're starting to, uh, to really uh, build those systems. Uh, and we're kind of on that cusp that within the next two to three years, we expect to see these kind of 50 to 100 uh, qubit systems operational and, uh, uh, and, and scalable. And that's the point at which um, we've seen a lot of work in superconducting that might stretch up to 100, 100, 200 uh, uh, qubits. But this is the point in which we can take up from that kind of 100 up to 1,000 levels of qubits. And that's what offers some of these big, uh, big step forwards in, uh, in, in potential uh, processing power. So how does this matter for, uh, for machine learning? And you know, where, where we're at with uh, machine learning, what, what's going to come uh, next in that in that journey into uh, into quantum machine learning. So we've kind of got the, uh, the 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 different um, aspects. You know, is there a human in the loop? Is there no human in the loop? Are we hardwiring the system, or are we building towards adaptive systems? And really, you've kind of moved from assisted intelligence, uh, where with a human there's augmented intelligence, or with no human, from automation to uh, to the automation of uh, uh, of intelligence, and I think one of the things that we've kind of seen in these fields just now is that uh, you know massive, uh, massive progress being made. Um, but when when Bill Gates came to, to Edinburgh last year, he said, you know, that one of the problems here is that mankind's running out of computational power. Um, we're roughly creating last year 
we created roughly half the data that mankind's uh, created. Next year, we'll produce twice as much. So suddenly, we're getting to the point that we uh, we really need uh, the, the the machine learning capabilities, but also the the, the increase in the scalability of the platforms. Uh, and we've now got things like you know Bitcoin using massive amounts of uh, uh, of global energy use just at the time that the planet needs us to to start and model and uh, and, uh, and redress pollution and. Uh, and, and climate change. So we've got a lot of things, a lot of moving parts in the uh, in the whole picture here. But th this journey to kind of start to uh, to take the uh, the uh, the uh, the leap forwards that we're seeing in uh, in automation of intelligence and, and to scale it uh, are going to be uh, seen through the, through these uh, through these platforms. And that, I thought this was kind of an interesting kind of economic contextual slide that uh, PwC did. Uh, last year, where they, they've kind of said that by uh, by 2030, GDP in the UK will be 10% higher, and that's roughly two two and a half k per per household uh, of uh, of increased spending power. Uh, that and that part is responsible for machine learning. Um, so we kind of start thinking, well, why does machine learning mean that mean that the UK GDP is going up? Well, we're, we're counting, sorry, UK uh, GDP. So we're, we're kind of at this point that a lot of the economy had been driven by the, by this part of the, the increase here. You know, this is um, this is labour productivity. So we always hear about the productivity gap and how productivity is uh, uh, driving the size of our economy. Um, but it's interesting that personalisation and uh, 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 different forms of using uh, uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning for uh, for utility has has actually been a an ongoing part of that. So ever since uh, business introduced computers, we've seen a component of that that's not been human productivity; it's been uh, machine productivity to that process. Um, but what we what we see now is, and what as we look into the future, is that that, that productivity isn't going to increase an awful lot, and a big part of the, uh, the economic pie is going to have to come from uh, uh, from uh, increases in uh, the way that we use intelligence and artificial intelligence. Uh, so we're, we're kind of all familiar with a, a lot of the things that are that are current hap currently happening with uh, uh, machine learning for voice recognition, recommending what we watch in our in our in our movies or our uh, 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 or listen to in our uh, uh, our music systems, um, planning maps, autonomous vehicles, facial recognition, uh, all all those types of elements, uh, and then really the sorts of uh, you know, kind of big breakthroughs that have really happened in the last uh, couple of years where AI has been used to uh, uh, teach itself how to simulate the process of, uh, of walking and the, uh, the Alpha Zero um, uh, success in, uh, in, in, in beating humans at some of these uh, incredibly uh, challenging uh, 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 games like uh, chess, Go and Shoji. So big changes uh, as the... Uh, as, as, as the kind of field, field moves forward. Uh, and it's amazing to kind of look at the, uh, the speed of, uh, uh, of, of, uh, of, of, of kind of progress. You know, we've, we've had to really see the whole, the whole of this cycle is also the, the underlying uh, uh, growth of the, the whole digital platform and how that, how that has grown uh, through, through the period to support uh, the machine learning and the, the artificial intelligence um, designs that can be that can be put in those platforms, and it now covers a a broad range of uh, 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 of, of, of different areas. You know, all the way from our personal time managing to uh, people now starting to use it in their household uh, financial management, uh, banks and uh, uh, big organisations and uh, uh, commercial organisations using it to to slim down their their, their workflows. Um, but also, um, you know, starting to see uh, interaction um, uh, with humans, where you know, actually, sometimes people know about it. Other times, they're, uh, they're 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 less sure about it. And is that a machine or is that a a person that's on the other end of my computer here? So, what what are the sort of things that we we sort of start to we, that we kind of start to see as kind of more complex problems in the in the next phase of things? Well. Uh, economic forecasting is there's more variables going to the pot, it becomes a more difficult problem. Uh, fraud detection, it's kind of this threat response cycle of, you know, the security guys do something and the, 
uh, the, uh, the, the bad guys start to find different ways of uh, uh, countermanding it. I mentioned climate modelling. Just as we start to see these uh, you know, strange uh, events and unnatural processes in our, uh, in our, uh, in our climate and in our, our weather patterns, how can we get a better handle on those to uh, help improve the situation but also to, to save lives and to take a uh, mitigating action in the, in the short run? Uh, and then in areas like power and internet and all, uh, uh, other forms of, of networks, how do we optimise those resources um, uh, for best purpose? Um, so we kind of, I thought I'd take a couple of kind of current examples and then kind of stretch forward into uh, what's likely to happen uh, next. So, uh, you know, machine learning technique that's really taken old processes or something like this, a credit scoring process that would have lots of manual backwards and forwards. And now there's, uh, there's, there are software platforms and cloud platforms where you can, you can kind of click a button and it runs through all those processes uh, uh, instantly and you, you, can, you can go online and you can get credit scored and a loan approved instantly. So um, things that would maybe take a week or two weeks are now down to uh, uh, a few <coughs> clicks. Um, but this is an interesting one as well from uh, just around the corner here at, uh, at UCL where um, this is the... Uh, the economic cycle um, uh, over the last number of years with the, uh, with the uh, 2008, um, uh, as it was reported in the BBC, decimation of, the, of global stock markets. Uh, and interestingly, you can actually see that uh, machine learning can, uh, can predict those types, of, uh, uh, those, those types of events. So that means that when people are kind of able to now start to show efficacy of these types of processes, it, it leads for a demand to, uh, to create more and more uh, capable, uh, capable predictions. Um, so if we look at, um, uh, if we look at a tropical cyclone, for example, starting to look at how the, the patterns evolve, we're now starting to get uh, much better at, uh, at forecasting and the ability to do that. Um, but the same sort of problem uh, happens in you know, wind shear at an airport, all these, all these different types of things. So if you want to model at higher resolution, the, the computational platforms become more and more uh, difficult. So what kind of improvements can, uh, can quantum lead to in, uh, in machine learning? Uh, so the American physicist uh, uh, Richard Feynman said, uh, well, nature ain't classical, so if you want to make a simulation of it, you'd better start with it being uh, uh, quantum mechanical. Um, so what's quantum good at? Well, you know, if you've got really high uh, dimensional data sets, you can put them in that kind of theoretical flask that I showed you on the, the Oxford slide. Um, if, you, uh, if you're able to, to kind of look at uh, the, the, the processes by which they can um, unite geometry and, and probability into, into a single set of solutions, things that start to get complex because of the, the computational power to, to stack them on top of each other are ideally suited for, for kind of uh, multi-scaling multi into, uh, uh, into, into quantum. And the other thing here is that you can create truly random uh, processes. So if, if random number and, and uh, the interactions of random numbers is important there. Uh, quantum's a good way to, uh, to do it. Now, one of the, the aims of quantum is that you can, you can speed up. So things that would take a very, very long time uh, using uh, classical quantum systems uh, could be speeded up. And we'll look at some, some example sets of that. Uh, but it's important to say that in quantum, that's not always the case. So there, there are limitations there. Um, and as we kind of said, we're, we're taking the very first uh, kind of baby steps towards scalable quantum computers. So we still don't yet have the, the scale of computer that could be important uh, to solve some, some very big problems. Um, quantum machine learning now, now actually exists for, uh, for certain tasks. Uh, and I think what we'll see over the next period is, uh, is a kind of degree of hybridization where uh, classical and quantum systems are, are able to combine the, the best of both worlds. Um, and what we will also start to see is that, that quantum, as it's been demonstrated with uh, some of the early machines, uh, is actually very well suited for uh, optimization uh, type classes of, uh, 
uh, of, of problems. So to, to kind of look at that, um, we, we got the example here of a, a problem that's a, that's a Hamiltonian, and with a, uh, with a class, classical system, there's, uh, there's, there's a, a, a huge amount of uh, thermal annealing needed to, to solve the problem, to, to find the, uh, the overall minimization. Um, but with quantum, we can, we can jump a lot of that process uh, in, uh, by using uh, quantum annealing. The types of things that this are going to be useful for that are, are kind of class level problems are things like asset manage, asset investment risk manage, so uh, risk management, optimization of trajectories, and I'll, I'll show an example of that, um, and, and ways that we can, uh, that there, there are to uh, optimize different forms of arbitrage um, of, of, uh, of uh, systems. So if we take well, where is the where's the where's the state of the art? So this is my uh, my glamour shot of me standing next to the uh, D Wave 2000 Q in uh, in uh, in Vancouver. Um, uh, it sounds like you're in a it sounds like you're in a washing machine. Actually, is what it sounds like. There's, these are noisy machines because at the heart of them we've got these uh, in this case 2,048 qubits. Now the problem with it, so this is this is cooled to about 15 millikelvin in this kind of cryogenic chamber that's in here. Now, the, 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 this device acts as a, as a quantum annealer, so that means that we're kind of on that part way in that journey to, uh, to quantum, but all of those 2,048 uh, 2, qubits uh, aren't, uh, aren't either uh, uh, high fidelity or, uh, or, or uh, ha having good lo uh, lifetime and uh, quantum uh, coherence, so that so we're not kind of creating the most uh, capable system, as I kind of described, that you'd require for uh, for quantum computing. But this this device acts as a uh, as a quantum annealer, and for uh, for certain class of problems, it's uh, it's uh, it's shown um, ability to create uh, quantum speed up. So, what sort of things could we uh, achieve through uh, quantum speed up? Well. Um, this type of system would be good for, for proof of uh, principles. Any problem that's got just a lot of computational overhead, so laying out the chip design on a, on a process or uh, doing search on the internet um, of, of, of very big uh, data sets, any of those things, if you can do it a bit quicker, you're going to save uh, time and money. So the first stage really is to use things like quantum annealers, and that gives a, a quadratic uh, speed up. But it's more when we start to be able to create these quantum, uh, these scalable quantum computers, that we'll be able to get to this kind of point of uh, uh, of exponential uh, uh, speed up, uh, and that's really where we kind of get to the point of having uh, about 100 qubits that are that are highly uh, uh, highly coherent and uh, and, and uh, that the entanglement is very strong across the, the whole of the ensemble. So. You know what are the what are the kind of caveats here? Well, there's not a kind of nice input from from classical straight into quantum. So we have to look at how do we get the the data and the and the, uh, the and the problem sets into a quantum format so that we can actually uh, speed them up. And as we said earlier, the the, the universal scalable quantum computer uh, doesn't yet exist, and the estimates are from a small number of years to a couple of decades uh, on, on, on that journey. So it's, it's not really clear exactly how fast this field is going to go. Um, but already we're, we're starting to see areas of, uh, of speed up. Um, so I said we'd, we'd look at, um, at Shor's algorithm. Uh, so what we can do, though, is we can use uh, classical computers to simulate quantum computers. Uh, so with a, with a pure quantum computer with the, the system at Innsbruck, the, the biggest number that's been factored is three times seven. So we can all do that in our head. 21 factors down to three times seven. But if we start to look at the scaling using quantum computers, uh, we, we're kind of now at the stage that, um, that we can factorize a number uh, about 57,000. But really, we have to get up through this number of, this number of qubits uh, and, and really get up, up here. So the, the, the overall rec record with all the computational power that we've got so far is about 230 uh, 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 digits. But as we see with a quantum computer, 
it's a much more constant amount of computing power that's needed to scale up to, uh, uh, to, to huge numbers of digits. Uh, the next area is to, to look at uh, a database search. So uh, Grover's algorithm has shown quadratic speed up. It's shown the ability to uh, provide optimal uh, solutions. And it's really the basis for about half uh, of all quantum machine uh, learning algorithms that have uh, that current, currently been uh, just, uh, demonstrated. Uh, the HHL algorithm is a way of exponentially speeding up uh, matrix inversion. Uh, be, and it, it's one of those algorithms that looks like it'll be uh, very useful for uh, deep neural networks. Uh, and other forms of, uh, of uh, uh, regressive um, uh, algorithm. Uh, so where can this kind of find applications? Well, in, in areas like optimized curve fitting, where uh, we've got two models here, one of which uh, models uh, the data points, but the second one is more accurate at being able to see the hidden, uh, the hidden trends uh, that we don't see between the uh, individual uh, data points. Or if we were to take something like an optimization a trajectory problem where we want to uh, find our way through a, 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 an ascent, um, th this would be a very uh, uh, good basis for, for these, types of, uh, these types of system. So where's, where's this likely to take us? Um, well, I think the, uh, the, the key to it is going to be picking the right problems for the, for the early days. Um, so in the near, the near term, identifying quantum solutions to very, uh, very uh, hard uh, classical problems is a, is a kind of key element. Um, longer term, as we start to get to the universal uh, scalable uh, quantum computer, and we get uh, two qubit gates with fidelities above 99.5%, we're really going to start to see things break through. And the whole uh, area of uh, quantum supremacy really happens at around about this 144 uh, qubits of information. Uh, but I think what we'll see is, uh, is hybrids in the 100 to 1,000 qubits um, starting to be, uh, to be important. So that's really the journey that we're on here. Clocks, computing, comms, and uh, uh, in the future into uh, in, uh, uh, different forms of imaging. So thank you.